Welcome to Fairy Tale Access, where the head fairy's quest is to prove that fairy tales do exist in actual time rather than once upon a time. Together, we will unravel the heroes, young and old, who turn dreams into reality. These are the people who still believe in happily ever after. The discoveries will bend even our most cynical non-believers into believing in fairy tales. Hi, welcome to Fairy Tale Access. I am so excited to introduce you to Martin Herman, the author of this extraordinary detective mystery series, the Will James series. Thank you for being here. It's such a pleasure. Thank you. Okay, so I've read online that you started writing only at the age of 75. I started publishing six months before I turned 75. I've been writing since sixth grade. Wow, how come you never had anything published before? Actually, I've had uh, short stories published under a whole series of pen names, but uh, it, it's quite a long story. Um, I had a, a sixth grade teacher who was just the best of the best, and she went out of her way to find uh, what makes each of her pupils different. And she pulled me aside one day and she said, uh, I think you have a talent, a unique talent, but I have been so wrong in so many times, let's find out if I'm right. She said, I want you to write a story every week for the rest of your life. I said, Mrs. Abendola, I'm, I'm 11 years old. She said, uh, follow me. I want a, a story every week. It can be a couple lines, it could be a few paragraphs, it could be a couple pages. But you gotta promise me that it'll have at least one person or place or, or event that even if the reader has no interest at all before they open the reading, they care what's gonna happen when they're in it. I missed a couple weeks. I didn't miss a lot of weeks, but I missed a couple weeks. And by eighth grade, I had sold my first short story to a magazine. And that's a long story of its own. How do you now cash a check in somebody else's name? Because I went into the phone book. Well, you wouldn't remember phone books. I do remember phone books. Well, phone books where you could just open them and put your finger down and say, that's my name for this story. And over the years, I've sold a few more, but most of my writing was for me. Um, as an adult, I turned companies around. So I traveled at one point almost 200,000 miles a year. And so I'd find myself in strange cities or uh, hotel rooms, airports, and I would just write and that would be uh, my release. And I'd get back home from my trips and whatever I wrote would go into this big corrugated box in my basement. And when it was full, I would dump it out in the garbage and start all over again. It was my secret, and up until the first book was published, my wife did not know that I wrote. My children did not know that. It was my um, release. Wow. And so one of the stories that I wrote on one of those trips, I was uh, on a, uh, an airplane uh, uh, for, it seemed like ever, in LAX, and it wasn't going anywhere. And out of boredom, I picked up a copy of USA Today that was left by my hotel room door that morning. It was in my attache case. I opened it up. And my eye went to a small news item about um, a, a sting operation that FBI had chosen to do against a group of uh, elected officials, some national, some local, who they thought were on the take. And all I could think of, show you how some people's minds work, Thomas Jefferson's been my hero since ever. What would Thomas Jefferson had done if somebody said, here's a bushel basket of money, it's now yours. All I want is a little influence. Who could it hurt? Because he was my hero, I really would hope that he'd pick this person up by the scruff of their neck and throw them out the window and then throw the money out after them. But who knows? You know, he's human. He was always in debt. 
these poor souls who were caught in the sting operation are just human? Who knows? And the more I kept thinking about it, the less interested I was in USA Today, and I pulled out a legal pad and started just writing, what would Thomas Jefferson do? And I played with it and played with it until when I returned home on that trip, I had almost 5,000 words and a skeleton of a storyline and the finishing two paragraphs. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't get myself to throw it in the corrugated box. So I played with it and eventually I had 45,000 words. That's almost a book. And kept working on it until I had 70,000 words. Now I was happy, tossed it on a shelf, fade out, fade in. My younger daughter has several books out, and she found it and started reading it. And she said, you know, Dad, this is really good. It is really good. Well, you aren't my daughter. And when my daughter said it, it didn't have the same meaning it does when you say it. And I said to her, you know, Amy, you're my daughter. What are you supposed to say? <laughs> it's the worst stuff I've ever seen. And she said, no, it's really good. Publish it. I'll help you. Nah, nobody wants to read my stuff. I do it for me. Eventually, it got down to the point was, you must do this. And if you know my daughter, she never does that. <laughs> and so she said, call a stranger. I was working with someone who I didn't particularly like. He didn't particularly like me, but there were always two, three books in his attache case. I printed out a, a, uh, a version of the Jefferson Files, and I sent it to him with a little note that said, what do you think? About a week or 10 days later, phone rings, no hello, no how are you? This thing you sent me, who the hell wrote it? <laughs> I said, I did. He started to laugh. You could never do anything this good. Tell me, who, what's the secret? Who wrote it? And I said, I did. He finally said, you know what? Here's how the phone call's going to end. I will ask you again. Give me the same stupid answer that is so unbelievable that I have to laugh every time you say it or I'm gonna hang up. Well, he did, I did, and he did. And you published. Well, I called Amy and I said, we're gonna publish. She came up between uh, two, I live in Connecticut, to uh, my home between Thanksgiving and Christmas in 2014 and helped me to edit it. In February of 2015, we published it, six months before I turned 75. Wow, so we have five Books? Well, actually seven. I have There's a book seven? of short stories I wrote with uh, Amy, mm -hmm. and I have a biography that I also wrote. So there are seven out, and I'm working on three now. Wow. What are the new three about? The new one? The new one? The newest. The new one is about a family of rogues, um, uh, con men. Oh, okay. Um, and it covers a 400-year period, eight generations of really good confidence men and women. And it starts in the 1600s in Liverpool, England, and I finally take you to America. And I'm in generation three, and I can't wait to get to it every night. Oh, that sounds fantastic. All right, so I'm sorry that I, I gave you, you such a long-winded answer. No, that was perfect. Now we know how you got to write these, but I want to know a little bit about each one. So the Jefferson Files? The Jefferson Files um, uh, was my way of testing two things. First of all, uh, when you have a hero forever and ever, <clears throat> what happens when you find out there's a, a nick in their armor? And that's a test of them. The test of you is what do you do about it? Do you muddy their name and say, look what I found out, Thomas Jefferson wasn't terrific? Or do you cover it up? And so I started writing from the viewpoint of 1806, there's a murder, Thomas Jefferson, and a, um, a secret society. He knows who did it. Even though he's president, he knows he can't touch them. What does he do? 
and now you have today and a real fan of Thomas Jefferson grew up loving him to pieces yes. and finds out about it and what does he do? And so my big problem was how do I link here to here, believably? And I found a way to do it that it so pleased me that I can't tell you how I started just to have fun once I realized Here's how I can link the two, and now I continue the story in two different generations. That's how it started. It was never meant to be a series. It was meant to be a book. Actually, it was meant to be a manuscript that was meant to be in a garbage box, but it didn't <laughs> wind up there. I appear with my books mm -hmm. because I like talking about it. And so I started to sell a lot of copies. <clears throat> it's in its eighth printing now. And the mail started to come in. Well, I'm a self-published book. You don't get mail. I was getting mail. I based the um, protagonist on a real person, a piece of uh, research that I came up with <clears throat> about someone who, um, at the age of 16, hacked the computer system of the Department of Defense. True story. In fact, in the 70s, there was a movie about it. Yeah, I love how you tie in true stories, real places, and then give us what they were at the end. Well, all of the books have some real people, places, things, and events, and pretend squished together. I like to tell in the back, now I do it in the last few uh, copies, I do it chapter by chapter, what was real, what was not. But at any rate, that's how that came to be. And because of the mail that came in and said, tell me more about this person, I felt someday I'll write a second book. The first box of uh, books come back from the printer, and I couldn't wait to read them as though I had never seen them before. And one thing stuck out to me. I like to think that I create a character that has 360 degrees, a little good, a little bad, a little real, a little wishing. There was one character in that book that had nothing but bad. He owned an antique store reluctantly. It wasn't nice what I did to poor Albert Frug. And so I figured, all right, if I write there another are book. There people like Albert in the world. But he deserved better from me. He did no harm to me. And here I made this poor, sad sack with nothing redeeming. At any rate, I have this framed um, permit. Um, that during Prohibition was given to people who had to legally make alcohol. Uh, if you were a doctor, if you were a priest, if you were a rabbi, um, if you made uh, shaving lotion, you had to have some alcohol. And the government freely printed out tens of thousands of permits, and you could have one. And I found one in a terrible wooden frame <clears throat> that I put in um, my great room. I passed it one day and instantly that, I need a book for Albert Frug. They want to know more about Will James. Right. That became this book, The Hidden Treasure. treasure. And The Hidden Treasure starts out very innocently. It starts out about a small antique store in Brooklyn, New York, where once a week Albert Frug auctions off the things he thinks are worthless. And one of the things is this um, framed document. Puts it up for $2. Within 10 minutes, two different people bid it up to $100,000. What's going on here? As you keep reading, you realize it was worth a lot more than that, but not to everybody, to a specific group of people, including the head of the New York crime family. And that's how it starts. That was really well done. Every single one of these books, I was up all night. Couldn't wait. This was one of my favorites. Well, Loved this happened because I had a couple loose ends floating around. I had a really bad, bad guy who had done a terrible thing to his adopted sister. And I needed to finish him off. I love how you finished And that's how that off. happened. <laughs> oh, that was so great. It's like what we all wish would happen. Well, this was the end of the series as far as I was concerned. 
and I was at a signing, and this 10-year-old girl said, uh, I have a question for you. Will James is supposed to be this computer hacker genius. We're going through times now, 10 years old. We're going through times now where hackers are in charge of the world. How do you not have them involved in that? The return to sender files. <laughs> yes. But this, this had a new so wrinkle. realistic. Well, I, I did a lot of research. I do a lot of research on all my books, but particularly this one because I'm computer illiterate. At any rate, this has a second wrinkle to it. In the book before, something very traumatic happens to my lead character. Up until the third book, you know very little about him personally, but you know that he can do anything he wants. He's just a strong-willed human being. Well, in the third book, something traumatic happens to someone he really cares about. And so this book opens up on a beach in Bridgeport, Connecticut, with him lying around in the dead of winter because something happened in the previous book, plays out there. I resolve it here. And uh, that was really incredible the first Tuesday of the month, Murder Files. Well, this is what you do with notes that you have that you can't use elsewhere. I, uh, I thought that was the end of my series. And I wanted to change, and I found this wonderful jazz musician. And I had heard that he was 90 years old, singing and playing guitar for an 18-piece live orchestra. I went, started a conversation with him, and wanted to write his story. He played with Ella Fitzgerald, Sammy Davis, Billy Holiday, Nat King Cole, Oscar Peterson, John Coltrane. And while I was researching it, I got to go to, appear, to appearances as well as rehearsals of this 18-piece live orchestra. And it struck me strangely that you had 18 human beings who were in a room, and it didn't matter if the room was this size or this size, they always sat in relation to the same other people. That was their position because of the sound of the instrument they were playing. And very few of them had any idea of anything in the life of the person behind them, in front of them, left or right. They came to play, and then they went home to their world. And it struck me, what if somebody picked off one at a time? Who would target a group of people who have no coherent reason other than they play music? And that became the first uh, Tuesday this, of the month. Yeah, they're really great, Marty. They're, they're so well done. You have no idea who did it. I love following through it. I couldn't put it down. and. I can't tell you how many nights I stayed up <laughs> late. Last sleep, but woke up like I have to find out. Maybe I can squeeze in another 15, 20 minutes here. What a nice compliment. Thank you so much. <laughs> no, thank you. These were such a great escape. I mean, this made you understand the way different people are thinking and how they catch people. This was awesome. I mean, I was just like, wow, that could really happen. <laughs> and then the sweet revenge. This is totally epic. For anybody who's had, like, anybody that was really mean to them in their lives. Here's payback. Uh, yeah. There's <laughs> karma. Oh, it was awesome. And the hidden treasure files. I just really loved the way this flowed. And the Jefferson's file was really well done and believable. Like, you know, you could go and get something at an auction and there could be a hidden drawer somewhere and you could find something. I mean, it happens all the time. Well, you hear about it all the time, but it doesn't happen all the time. Right. Well, no, you hear about it all the time because it happens sometimes, which could be all the time, which would be like, oh, I, this could actually happen to me. I could actually change your whole it. world. Right, you know? 
but the ending, I was kind of torn because it also dealt with the wrongly accused and how that affects them, you know, and that turmoil, you know, even after everything's turned over, that was incredibly well done. So you hit on really good social topics that are going on and twisted into the story. And when I think I've got it, I'm like, oh, and it totally makes sense why your first assumption doesn't go right. It's so at the sweet end. to say that. Thank you so much. No, it's the best. I love <laughs> like everything. I love Agatha Christie and you know, growing up with detective novels. I mean, that was my thing as a kid. I had all the kids in the neighborhood. This was such a great detective series. Seriously, you're gonna read you. is there more? I have um, I, really like I have an games. idea for a, another one, now that I've introduced a love interest for him. Um, but I really want to do my 400-year trail. And I also have a book on business I want to do. I, I was in business most of my life. I turned companies around for 50 years, 55 years. Wow. Um, startups, turnarounds all over the world. Uh, I'd love to do the kind of a business book that isn't a sterile and um, kind of admits, I screwed up here, but I learned from it. I screwed up here. I didn't quite learn the first time, the second or third time. Boy, I learned. Or this is just common sense that I've picked up along the way, and here's how it happened. And I think that kind of book has an opportunity for um, young managers who, once they get their positions, are ashamed to say, I need help. I think that's really true. I think that would be a great book. Well, I think we'll that, find out. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I think that people need to understand that it's okay to make mistakes, that it's important as a manager to ask for help, to build a team as to include them and make them feel inclusive. You know, like you can tell them what's wrong all day long, but if you don't tell them what right they're gonna leave you all the good ones are and gonna not leave you. learn from it and exactly if, and you're destined to do it all over again especially it happens in large companies a yeah. lot even in small family run companies really you know dad said do it so I do it but every time I do it something bad happens maybe we should talk about it well it's dad all right it's his company that's true, too. <laughs> God, what is it like working for Trump? <laughs> We're learning. <laughs> yeah, we'll see how that goes. That was different. But no, I think those are all great. But we really want another Will James. And we love how you mix real people into this story. Well, I, I um, if there's time, it's an interesting way it happened. I was signing books, and a woman said... Uh, I've always wanted to be in a book. And it just rang in my head, well, you should be able to be in a book. Write your book and I'll buy it. And she said, no, I don't want to write it. I want to be in it. And it struck me that maybe we can find a way. And so the next time I appeared, I had these little slips of paper that simply said, um, here's a drawing. You don't have to pay anything. If I pull your name, you'll be a character in my next book. And the first one I really did it with was this one. And this one, I pulled three names. And I did it when my book was almost ready for editing. And so I pulled the three names and my commitment to them was, I won't just use your name, I'll interview you and make my character a mirror image of you. And one of the names I pulled was an, a 10 year old girl who I found so interesting at 10 who had accomplished more stuff than most people do in their 30s, um, I rewrote four chapters. And then it struck me, well, gee, you know, it's a different ending now, but it's more natural. And so that's how it started. I now pull names for the new book. I'm pulling a whole lot of names because it's 400 years. And, um, but I find it more exciting for me because I may know how it's gonna end, Mm -hmm. But once I pull the names, it's a whole new ballpark. Wow. 
I would love to be in your books. You can definitely use me. <laughs> but I mean, that's such a great thing because whether you're the good guy or the bad guy, you know, it's just fun. Like seeing that somebody else has your name in a story. I would especially have liked to have been in this one. In, been the what one that part had the would revenge. you have liked to be? This one would have been fun to be the Russian girl. And the end in that she got. Her I love that character. She's gutsy and she's smart. And uh, I'm the father of two daughters. So I'm okay. the original woman's feminist. And I find her really the star of wherever she is. And it came out of whole cloth. Did you ever meet a real person like her? Not that I'm aware of, but I, I'm certain that everyone that you create as a writer is just an accumulation of bits and pieces of people you've known, and they're all out there. You just have to listen. Definitely. And with all of your travels, I think that really plays into how you understand people, the way they move, the way they talk, where they're located. You know where the like where his office is located, everything. Well, there isn't an address in any of these books: China, the Ukraine, Germany, the U.S. That I haven't actually walked to find the place. And you're you're referring to his office, which is a uh, a converted a building that was a, a Spanish grocery store with graffiti and boards all over the front of it and the most modern everything inside of it. And I walked up and down Albany Avenue in Hartford, Connecticut until I, because I wanted a neighborhood that was really rough and tough. And how do you exist in that? And it tells you in the story. And I, I saw this sugarloaf shaped building with all the graffiti you could ever imagine. There wasn't an inch of space for anything else and garbage all over the what would have been the parking lot with weeds growing through it. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Oh, well, you are going to come back and tell us about the next series, right? Oh, it would be my pleasure. Oh, thank you so much for coming in and sharing. Thanks for inviting me. It was a pleasure. It's as good as reading your books. Totally you. a fan. Thank you, thank you. Can't wait to see more, too. So until next time, keep asking questions. And if you want a great detective series, you feel like you're in the mood for revenge, you could actually pick up anywhere. But reading from book one through five is the best way. We'll see you soon. Thank you.